Hello, good afternoon and welcome to today's episode of Modesty's Mortgage Masterclass. It's another lovely Wednesday and another opportunity for us to all gather here and learn more about mortgages and the UK property market and what's going on. Have updates, get ourselves educated, get ourselves updated on the knowledge around the UK property market and what the UK mortgage market is doing. Okay, so this is episode number nine, session number 19 of our Modesty's Mortgage Masterclass. And today we are going to be giving you updates as usual on the mortgage market and then continuing with our discussion on some live case scenarios that I've been dealing with over the past few weeks just to give you an indication, uh, uh, an idea of what lenders are looking for and how lenders are looking at cases and what their requirements are and how we are trying to navigate around these things and how we are trying to place these cases okay <clears throat> maybe one or two of them might resonate with you it might be peculiar to you as well so just to let you know that there are these things we don't just talk about um theories we do them pra practical they actually happen so i remain your man and your friend hey please don't be offended by the shirt I'm putting on. If you're offended, well, I can't do anything about it. But then, it wasn't a very good night for Arsenal last night, though. Um, yeah, we we were expecting to beat Leicester City, but they ended 1-1. So, no victor, no vanquish. We move on, we push on, okay? If you're a football fan, you understand what I'm talking. If you're not a football fan, hey, please don't switch off. <laughs> don't turn off um, that channel, okay? Just keep listening keep watching we are done with football now i promise i'm not going to talk about football again i'm just going to go straight into why we are here all right guys i hope you've had a very good week so far it's the midweek already and we're already looking forward to the week ending and you know before you know the weekend is here and the week is gone and then we're into another new into a new week we just entered july um, a week today and it's already july the 8th you know, so the first week of July has flown past and we're already into the second week of July. And then um, just think about what you've done within the first week and what you look forward to doing in the weeks to come. <clears throat> but then we live in the here and now. Let's deal with what's happening now and today. Tomorrow will look after itself, okay? Okay, so house prices again is on the news. House prices is on the news again. The UK house prices have it's fallen for the fourth month in a row you know according to halifax data that just came out that this is the first time in 10 years that there has been four consecutive months of uk house prices decline okay now before you start screaming that the whole world has come crashing it's just fallen by 0.1% compared to May. So this data came out um, as, a, it's as a June. So when you compare the house prices in June and that of May, it, it, there was a 0.1% decline in the UK house prices. It's insignificant, but at the same time, it's all about the data. You know, it's just, it's a slight um, reduction and it's a, a slight fall in house prices but then for four consecutive months there has been that slight movement downwards so it looks like um, the, the the whole uh, sentiment around being released from lockdown and people rushing in to go and buy these properties you know the sentiment is beginning to dwindle a little bit but activities are still very high in the property sector it's simply a case of okay for the for four, for four consecutive months now the house prices have experienced a downward pressure but then the average house price as at june this year was 2.5 percent higher as at june last year so what does that tell you that year on year the data favors you know is on the upward rise that there's upward pressure if you are comparing a year-on-year -year data but if you are comparing a month-on-month -month data it's a decline i mean a lot of people would rather focus on the year-on-year -year data showing that they have the, the the prices or the value of their assets at least appreciated by 2.5 percent compared to this time last year 
at the door um, month on month there's a 0.1 percent decline so this has happened for the first time in 10 years the last time this happened was in 2010 when the property market was recovering from the financial crisis that was the first time that it there was a four month consecutive decline in uk house prices but then <clears throat> you look listen to this mortgage inquiries you know because you think uh, there's a slight decline for four consecutive months on uk house prices therefore it means that nothing is happening in the property market no far from it because mortgage inquiries are having a bumper time in fact mortgage inquiries doubled in june compared to uh, the statistics we had in may and i am a mortgage broker and i can tell you for real that that is absolutely true you know we're getting more and more inquiries you know by the day more and more people looking to buy properties even though um you know the house prices are, are reducing nobody's waiting to see whether house prices are gonna go rock bottom or not people just want to get on with it and they want to buy properties whether they're buying for investments or they are buying for residential purposes you know or they are buying for family members they just want to get on with it so We've been inundated with inquiries for mortgages and it's been a very, very busy time and a very, very busy period for us. So, but hey, I still find time to come and talk to you and give you these updates. If not, I should be somewhere now dealing with mortgage inquiries and my clients inquiry. But hey, my clients also benefit from what I'm doing. So they would excuse me to, you know, give you half an hour of my time every Wednesday to make sure that we are all updated with what's going on in the properties and mortgage market <clears throat> now with um with prospective so looking at that data that came out um from halifax about house prices the thing is prospective uh, buyers are going back to finish transactions that were put on hold before the lockdown and that's actually what is also fueling the increase in mortgage inquiries because people were in the middle of a, of a property purchase transaction and then lockdown happened they put it on hold they put it in the freezer and then the moment activities returned to the property sector on May the 13th people have gone back to conclude the transactions that they put on hold so it's kind of fueled um, the, the mortgage inquiries and the mortgage businesses that have been booming since the lockdown was really uh, was eased in May in the property sector so um, that's uh, basically giving you giving us a reason to see the rise in mortgage inquiries uh, recently even after the lockdown now, um, the, the Halifax um, MD, Russell Gulley, the way he's, he looked at this is that, you know, there, these are indications to point towards a reduction in, uh, in house prices. He's looking at it from the medium term uh, outlook, that in the medium term, there are indicators that there, there, there will be a slight reduction in house prices in the medium term, at least between now and um and the end of the year although we have not started seeing you know a significant reduction but you know he is looking at it from the um perspective of the sentiments kind of waning out and then the urge to just push on and get on with this property and get onto the property ladder kind of win winning um as well so when these things begin to happen the property market begins to slow down a little bit and it affects the house prices and the house prices will be experiencing a gradual reduction that's the the, the prediction of the um, Halifax MD um, Russell so but when we saw uh, the survey that was carried out uh, among estate agents and household basically suggests that the sentiments are beginning to win a little bit a little bit as well because um, estate agents, even though they've, they've never been this busy, in fact, June was one of the busiest, June 22 was one of the busiest um, months for estate agents and for mortgage brokers as well. But then, um, six weeks on from the easing of the lockdown in the property sector, we're beginning to see a little bit of that 
of that sentiment waning a little bit, you know, which is um, informing people's you know, to kind of tweak the prices on their properties a little bit just to make it a little bit more attractive. And the reason people are also willing to tweak that price a little bit is because people are really interested in buying properties. So, and they would want to attract people who want to buy properties, especially at this time when there isn't that, um, you know, that high loan to value mortgage products available in the market. So people who want to buy now are people who have a substantial amount of deposits to put down. And those are people who are serious about buying properties. So if you're serious about selling, this is a time to find serious buyers because serious buyers are in the market now. They have got you know um, a good amount of deposits because the products in the market su suggest that you have to have a good amount of deposits for you to actually have more options. So the full impact of you know the pandemic on the UK economy and labour market will become clearer, you know, in the autumn. You know that's when the the UK economy and labour market will be feeling the full impact of this pandemic, and that full impact will have will definitely have an impact on house prices and the housing market. So it, it all depends on how the government manages this, to be honest with you. Because um, if the government do enough to keep people in jobs and people have um, a good uh, feeling about their job and financial and economic security, it's going to encourage them to you know, take bold decisions like buying a property. But if people don't feel very secure about their jobs and you know the prospect of their earnings and income in the future is not very bright, they will just shy away from big and major decisions like this and it will definitely have an impact on the housing market. So it's all about how the government handles this. The government have been ruling out measures throughout this lockdown to support people in work. But we are hearing that, you know, the... Um, we are hearing that the furlough, the furlough scheme by the government is going to end in October, meaning that after October, the government will not extend the furlough scheme. That's what we are hearing. And if that is the case, it then becomes a case of what happens next to these workers who are on furlough. Are they going to all lose their jobs? Is the government going to watch them and listen and just fold their hands and do nothing and you know watch them lose their jobs? We are yet to see. But it looks like the government is planning more to focus on supporting businesses so that businesses can now create more jobs and then employ people rather than just directly you know paying people's wages for god knows when there are people there are experts also who are pushing for the government not to um you know end the fellow scheme in october to at least take it up to the end of the year to enable people to fully recover and businesses to fully recover from the impact of covid but we're yet to see how um, the government is going to um, handle that. Okay, so it depends on how the government handles this. That's, that will tell us what impact is going to have on the housing market. Now, um, according to Miles Robinson, Miles Robinson is the um, head of Tussle Mortgage. He's the MD of Tussle, uh, Trussle Mortgage, an online mortgage um Firm. So what the, he's saying that the impact of the pandemic on the property market, you know, is becoming a little bit clearer and that the downward trend of house prices, you know, offers first time buyers who have a sizable deposit, a window of opportunity to actually buy good, good properties at, um, a low, at lower prices. So, by the way, the average UK house price now stands at just over £237,000. That's on average. So, what, uh, what trust? Hi, Alex. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming on, bro. So, what Alex is saying, what Miles Robinson is saying is basically that if you are a first-time buyer, the downward trend of house prices now, even though you require a higher level of deposit to get a mortgage even as a first time buyer because now we can't even um, find 95% loan to value mortgages anymore for first time buyers in fact one lender launched a 95% loan to value um, product I think it was just yesterday 
and he launched that product just for um, people who live within the area where the lender is operating so it's not a national not available for to um, people all over the all over the UK it's only available to people within the region where the lender operates so and you know we're beginning to see some of these regional product designs crop up because lenders are some lenders are keen to help um, you know borrowers in their region to develop and to get access to mortgages you know if they don't have a national outlook they might just want to influence their immediate area at least to control that market and this lender um thanks alex <laughs> and this lender is basically trying to encourage buyers in that locality in that region to have access to mortgages to be able to buy properties okay so um if you are a first time buyer and you've got you know maybe 10 15 percent deposits 15 percent deposit looks more likely now because even the 10 percent deposit now is becoming a little bit difficult to even come across there are just a few 10 percent uh, deposits mortgages available on the market but you have more options you have up to 15 percent deposits because that is basically where lenders feel very comfortable to lend now the 85 percent loan to value product range now <clears throat> comparing six weeks before the lockdown and six weeks after the lockdown according to Miles Robinson he's saying that you know there has been a 206 percent increase in mortgage applications for first-time buyers between six you know comparing six weeks before lockdown and six weeks after lockdown so basically first-time buyer mortgage applications have increased by more than 200 percent since after the lockdown compared to what it was before the lockdown and then for next time buyers, that's already existing mortgage owners it's a, it has been 209 percent increase six weeks on from the lockdown so uh, you are beginning to see how busy the mortgage market has been since after the lockdown last week i did mention that people are very keen to get on with their lives you know they just want to get on the property ladder if they could and because people are feeling a little bit wealthy at this moment in time that the government is still supporting people's income and businesses they are thinking okay now that i can still get a mortgage i better get on with it and get this mortgage and deal with it later on you know because lenders are willing to lend even based on your fellow scheme so if you can get a mortgage now get a mortgage get the proper get on the property ladder and then get on with it but if you haven't got the deposits well there's nothing you can do about it you still have to source the deposits and make sure you have enough deposits to put down to um, be able to get a mortgage so um now, so the boost in mortgage activity could be attributed to uh, what is kind of called now the rural renaissance a lot of people who dwell in the city are beginning to move out of the city into rural areas to go and buy residential properties because they consider the city house prices unsustainable and they just they, they are getting better value for money when they buy in the rural area so it's there's kind of resurgence of what they call rural renaissance now of people drifting away from the city going into rural areas to buy properties because properties there are a lot cheaper and they get better value for money and hey property prices also appreciate in these areas even if they are not as long as they're not too far away from those urban areas like places like london surrounding cities and places around london have a good house price appreciation level people are moving away from cities where the house price is exorbitant and they're just moving to places where it's very much affordable buy a property there and then as long as it's got a good transport and um commuting links they're happy to commute from that place to work and then you know come back and reside there so we are seeing a shift in that um you know towards that trend so the um the reemergence of high loan to value mortgages could be another booster to the mortgage um markets you know for first time buyers so we know that recently there has been a you know a withdrawal a series of withdrawals of high loan to value mortgages from the market by lenders 
but gradually some lenders are beginning to return again to this high loan to value mortgage um, sector they are bringing back high loan to value mortgage products into the market so if the more lenders we have operating in that sector and releasing this kind of products in the market the better for first-time buyers and the better for all home movers as well because that means that they can, they have more product choices and then they are more encouraged to buy properties because they will require less deposits. So that's the way we are seeing what you know um, what's going on in the mortgage market at the moment. Okay, now the Chancellor is also expected to make a big announcement today. I'm gonna to come. I'm gonna discuss the Chancellor's plans, you know, in more details later on. But there's a big announcement that uh, is expected from the Chancellor today about around stamp duty, stamp duty land taxes, you know, about freezing stamp duty land taxes for some time for some category of transactions. And if that is done, it's really expected to give the property market a huge kick up, like activities are going to seriously pick up if that announcement happens and the, and the chancellor you know um, includes that in that statement so but for now the property market is just holding up and it is sustained by a nervous energy and uh, but that energy we don't know how long that energy is going to um, sustain the property market for so the summer statement by this by the chancellor um, hasn't been more important so all eyes are glued to the tv today waiting for that announcement listening carefully to what the chancellor has got to say today but make no mistake about it the biggest challenge for the uk government now is undoubtedly keeping people in jobs because if people are kept in jobs that's going to have a very positive impact on the property market if people lose their jobs and the the you know the prospects of their earnings and their income in the future is not really looking very bright. It's going to have a damaging impact on the property market. And the UK economy largely, hugely depends on the housing sector if the UK economy is going to hold up. Because the housing sector plays a very, very important role in um, the economy being sustained in the UK. <clears throat> okay, now, second, let's talk about something else that's happening in the property and mortgage market <clears throat> buy to let mortgages now buy to let mortgages are basically mortgages that are available for landlords and property investors to buy properties for for investment purposes so there have been more buy to let mortgage products come onto the market very recently which is very very good news for landlords it means that landlords have got more options now in terms of their buy to let mortgages so um these buy to let mortgages as at the start as at start of march there were two uh 2583 buy to let mortgage products as at start of march and then it fell to 1455 and then by the start of may it fell to 1455 but as at 1st of july it's now come up to again 1738 is still not up to the level it was pre lockdown but between may and june we have seen another 238 buy to let mortgage products come onto the market so buy to let landlords have more options now and it's good news for them because it then means that they can you know choose from a wider range of mortgage products to enable them buy their investment property now for the breakdown of this um increase in mortgage products for buy to let uh, applicants that's come onto the market shows that you know two year fixed mortgages at 80 percent loan to value had the biggest increase in this buy to let uh, mortgage products it's increased from 9 to 31 so that's about 22 extra products of two year fixed buy to let mortgages at 80 percent loan to value and then the five year fixed mortgages at 80 percent loan to value saw an increase from 6 to 19 so there was an extra 13 products added to the market between may and june which is encouraging it simply is an indication that lenders are willing now to lend to buy to let landlords and there is more appetite for them to lend to buy to let landlords which is good news for buy to let landlords given the horrible couple of months that <laughs> landlords have had you know with the lockdown and tenants some tenants not paying you know and landlords having to resort to um 
mortgage holidays and you know it's not been a very good past few months for landlords but this is going to be a good news for them it's going to cheer them up a little bit so it, they've got more options and then now it's also showed that um, the average interest rates for this buy to let mortgage products to is stood at 2.51 percent you know but now it stands at 2.61 percent so it's been a little, a little bit of increase in the average uh, buy to let interest rates and from 2.97 percent <clears throat> sorry for five-year pr uh, fixed products it went up from 2.94 percent on average to 2.97 percent on average interest rates then landlords are gonna love this news you know there has been this uh, survey that was carried out um, with the about tenancy applications so there's a letting platform called good lord so this uh, survey was carried out um, with respect to uh, tenancy applications and it showed that tenancy applications have increased by 90 percent from 2019 levels so there's been a 90 percent increase in tenancy applications it means that there's a strong demand for rental properties and for um, you know there's a strong rental demand out there so landlords have a market and the market is out there for them to explore if the rental demands are there and they are strong it means that there's a huge opportunity for buy to let landlords to explore but then again it's also an indication of the fact that first-time buyers or people who want to buy properties still cannot get mortgages to buy properties because there isn't enough mortgage product options for them in the market so what they've got to do is they just resorted to continue renting waiting for the mark for the market to at least favor them in a little bit without them having to come up with a huge amount of deposit okay but then it's an opportunity for landlords and buy to let investors to hey get in the market because there is strong rental demand so it simply shows that the buy to let market is on its way to recovery so if it's on its way to recovery, that's good news for landlords and that's good news for property investors. So the rental market is proving really strong for those who are looking to buy to let. Looks like there is good markets for you out there. Hi, Ike. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming on. Okay, now I'm going to talk about um, the Chancellor's uh, big statement expected today. What is the Chancellor? expected to say today and how is that going to affect the property market now according to government sources that was published on um, the times it show it, it's saying that the chancellor is expected to announce a stamp duty freeze right to boost the housing economy so what does this plan entail although the plan doesn't come into place until around autumn uh, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak is expected to announce a stamp duty freeze for anyone who is looking to buy a property of up to £500,000. Okay, so that announcement is expected to happen today and people are really, really looking forward to that and to see what the details are. So it means for anybody who is looking to buy a property of up to £500,000, then Chancellor is saying there will be no stamp duty payable at least between now for at least six months to one year we don't know for how long that freeze is gonna be so it's meant to give the you know inject a little bit of pace and life into the property sector because if the if the, uh, if, the if the stamp duty is frozen for say six to twelve months for properties worth up to five hundred thousand pounds it means that first time, uh, you know, people who are buying properties who are meant to pay stamp duty on them will not have to pay any stamp duty on those properties as long as they are not worth more than £500,000. Now, to give you an indication of how this is different from the current practice or what is um, obtainable now. So if you're a first time buyer currently, you are exempt from any kind of stamp duty for properties that are worth up to £300,000. For first-time buyers, now if you are a next-time buyer, meaning that you already you are a, an existing property owner, 
if you buy a property and it's an additional property, if it's an extra property that you're buying, you are, you are expected to pay extra 3% stamp duty on top of what is already um, obtainable, or on top of what you're supposed to pay, or what other people pay on that property. Okay, so for example, if, um, if you buy a property of say, um, 275,000 pounds, the normal, under normal circumstances, if you're not a first time buyer, the first 125,000 pounds is stamp duty free. Yeah, then the next um, stage of between 125,000 pounds and one pound up to 250,000 pounds. Yeah, you pay a 2% stamp duty. Right, and the next level of between 250,000 and one pound up to 925,000 pounds, you pay 5% duty on top of that. So, this is the layered levels of stamp duty tax that people are paying. So, if this plan comes into effect and it is if the chancellor announces it, it means that from zero to 500,000 pounds, you are not going to pay any stamp duty at all, whether you're a first time buyer or you are um, an existing property owner so um, it's expected that this is gonna save people an average of two thousand pounds in stamp duty for an average house price of two hundred thirty two thousand pounds in england and wales so that's really going to encourage movers people who want to move home who are scared of how much they're gonna pay in stamp duty it's really gonna encourage them to move because the property they are going to buy there will be no extra stamp duty payable on it because if you are going to move home you would have paid five percent extra on top of property prices above the two hundred and fifty um, thousand pounds threshold so if that if that is taken out of the equation this the money you're going to save on that you're going to spend it on something else. So you imagine the ripple effect is going to have on other parts of the economy, like people who are looking to buy furniture, electronics, and gadgets, and things that they need, you know, home decoration stuff. The money you're going to save on stamp duty, you might, have, you, you, you might decide to splash it on, you know, decorating your homes, buying new furniture, buying new electronics, and all that. That's going to have a ripple effect on the economy. And that's basically what the Chancellor is looking to achieve if he announces this today in the summer statement. Okay, so it, people are really eager to get this happen. And they've been calling for this for quite some time. And it looks like the Chancellor is going to uh, listen to this call. But then um, experts are also saying that, hey, it's all well and good looking after the people at the entry level of the property market. What about the people at the higher end on the property market, the one million pound plus homes? You know, because the changes are not as expected to affect those ones. It then means that the the um, the e extraordinary amount they pay in stamp duty will remain, which is, you know, for properties above one point five million pounds, you could pay up to twelve percent, you know, in um, in stamp duty, and you could pay up as much as ten percent in stamp duty for properties worth up to um, above one million pounds. So. It's, it's extraordinary. So if you do not look after those high-end people as well, it means that some of them are going to be sitting on their properties and they're not going to move. And people who want to buy that level of property will not also want to buy because the stamp duty is, is too much for them to pay. But if the, you know, the experts are saying, if you look after those at, the, at that very high end, then people who are living in that property who want to downsize can actually downsize and go and buy a smaller property, especially people who are retiring and who just want to live in a smaller property. They can actually downsize and go and live in a smaller property and then people can, you know, move up. So it will favor people who are going up and who are going down the ladder as well. So in any direction of the property ladder that people are going, it will favor them. If the government tries to do something for those who are the very, who are the top end of the property ladder as well. So you know they are being encouraged to as well look after those at the high end as well as looking after those at the very entry stage of the property ladder so we are very much watching and waiting to see how this all pans out 
Okay, so um, no doubt uh, the corona uh, virus has had its impact on the UK economy. But then the government is doing whatever they can to get Britain moving again. Because the idea behind this stamp duty is to get people moving. Because when you remove the stamp duty, people are encouraged to move and buy properties. And you know that if you, if you own a property and that property is on the market and you want to sell that property before you buy, if you didn't manage to sell that property before you buy your uh, the next property you're buying, you, you will pay stamp duty quite all right on the next property you're buying because it's going to be an additional home as long as you still own that home that is on the market. But then if that property that is on the market sells for within the next 36, within 36 months after you moved, you can actually apply to the HMRC for a refund on your um, stamp duty that you paid when you bought that other property because it means that you no longer own the old property you now own one single property so any tax you have paid while you are buying that property while the other one was on the market you are going to get a refund from that you know your accountant can help you make that application you can make the application yourself to the hmrc and claim that tax back even if that property is not on the market at the time you were moving but by the time you move down within 36 months, basically three years, after, <clears throat> within three years of you moving out of that property and you sold it, you can still make that application and claim the stamp duty land tax back because then you, you are no longer classified as having additional property. So you get that, um, you get that stamp duty refunded to you. Okay, so... Now, I'm just going to talk briefly about, you know, the live case scenario that I want to talk to you about today, just to give you an indication of what we are doing and how we are doing and how lenders are reacting and what lenders are looking out for, really, when we make applications. Now, this is a very strange one to me, basically. I had a client who wanted to buy an investment property, and he wanted me to arrange a mortgage for him to buy that investment property. So, he wanted to buy this property through a limited company, an SPV. <clears throat> Okay, so um, this client, he has got, you know, clean credit records, he hasn't got any defaults, no CCJs, no adverse credits and all that. Has got a, a good job on his own. Um, the company already has one property in its name, so he's looking to increase or expand his portfolio. And, uh, so it, to me, it looked straightforward. And then we went through the whole process and I, I did my research and I found him a lender. And I found him that lender who I felt and I thought was basically going to just, it was going to be a very smooth selling application. But then some, the lender came back after the application to say, hey, sorry, can now we, we are having to decline this application because the client has too many un, unsecured debts. <clears throat> so... Basically, they are saying the client has too many credit cards, he's got too many loans, he's got, you know, loans and higher purchases and all that. He's got too many of them for their liking. And that was really a strange one. And I was like, okay, I said to them, now, the basis of affordability calculation for uh, limited companies, even for investment properties, is based on what we call the ICR, interest cover ratio. If the income, if the rental income on that property is enough to cover the interest on that mortgage and then with 25 or 45% more left after the interest is covered, the affordability is, is, is certain, it's done. It means that that property can pay for itself. So why are you concerned about this client's personal debts and this client's personal uh, circumstance? After all, he's also buying in a limited company name not even in his own personal name so it's the, the limited company is a different entity from this person the limited company owns the property and this person is a shareholder and a director in that company so there are two different entities but i know although i know that um the applicants the directors or the, share, the, or the shareholder if he's the director as well will also have to be assessed and their personal circumstances looked at but the personal circumstances don't always you know take the front seat in that affordability assessment 
But in this case, they were particular about, you know, the amount of credit cards and loans and higher purchases that this person had. So I had that conversation with them and they said, well, you know, that's basically what they feel and they don't feel they can lend to this. So what I basically did is I, I just went to a couple of other lenders <clears throat> and I spoke to them and I tried to gauge their uh, perception of that situation. And I spoke to about three or four lenders after that. And each one of them said to me, we are not too bothered about this person's personal circumstance. If the property and the investment itself can prove that it can afford to pay for the mortgage and itself, we are happy. And I was like, that's basically what it should be. So cutting long story short, I went to another lender who was happy to lend purely based on the ICR on that property without considering too much of the, of the uh, applicants or the director's personal circumstance. They will look at it. It doesn't mean that if you are if you're you have a poor credit rating or if you're if you have an adverse credit that they will just jump in and lend to you. They will look at it, but to them the personal the personal debts of the director is not a, a major factor in deciding whether they are going to lend or not. The major deciding factor to them is the property, the investment itself. Is it, is it generating enough to pay for the mortgage and pay for itself? If that is the case, they will be happy to lend. So I got the client um, another deal from another lender who was happy to lend based on that uh, assumption. So just to let you know that, you know, sometimes the things you think are straightforward are not as straightforward as you think. And hey, you know, take it easy when you are, when you are taking on so much debts. You see, I think... Um, there was a survey I saw online that the average UK credit card debt is at £63,000 on average. That's humongous. Okay, so take it easy when you are taking on these, especially revolving credits like credit cards, right? Take it easy when you are taking them on. And when you are taking on all them loans and all the, every, all the credits you are taking, slow down a little bit, just know that at some point you will have to pay these things off and if you if you don't manage them excellently for every credit you take that is very new it kind of drags your credit rating down a little bit until you start managing it and you know after a couple of months time the lender see that yes you are managing this situation very well and then your credit rating starts creeping up a little bit again so for every fresh credit you take your credit rating takes a little bit of a knock until you start paying that over a couple of months and then your credit rating starts you know rising again so sometimes you might take these credits and take these loans and thinking that hey you're doing yourself a favor but if you can afford to minimize on them and you know reduce them and pay whatever you owe off it makes a lot of sense especially revolving credits like credit cards they drown you they drain your finances and they don't allow you to move. If you want to make investments and you have a lot of debts, especially consumer debts, debts that you are not, you didn't take out to invest. If they are consumer debts and you're making investments, the returns on your investments are actually being taken by the interest you are paying on those consumer debts. So you're almost like gaining from here and losing elsewhere. So it makes sense for you to sort out your consumer debts before you start investing. If you want to reap the full benefits of your investments, so that when you are reaping the benefits and the returns on your investments, they are in your pocket to stay. Otherwise, if you make 5% um, return on your investment and your consumer debts interest stands at 7%, you are still on minus two <laughs> you know, returns. Your net return is minus two. Okay, so it makes sense to take care of those consumer debt because they really eat deep into your investment returns. All right, folks, this is um, how much time could allow us to take today. And I hope this has been useful to you. And I hope you found this um, educative enough. Please, we always say, give us your feedback. Let us know what you think. Um, you can go to my YouTube channel. Just Search my name on YouTube, Iken Naomezu DK. We've got catalogs of um, contents on our YouTube channel of the past sessions that we've done, 
our Monday um, Money Masterclass sessions. We've got loads of them on YouTube. Our Wednesday Mortgage Masterclass, we've got loads of them on YouTube as well. On whatever platform you are watching us, please give us your feedback. You can share this video for everyone who, want, who you think is going to benefit from it and leave us your feedback and let us know what you think because the more we hear from you about how useful this is to you, the more encouraged we are. And there might be somebody who might benefit from this by you just sharing it and commenting on it it gives more people access to listen to this to watch this and to benefit from that that's until then i'm happy to say goodbye and i look forward to seeing you again on monday when we do our money master class and next week wednesday again when we come back for another bumper package of our mortgage master class thank you very much god bless you have a lovely day and stay blessed bye now